Hey guys and welcome to another video. Today the topic is the good old 386 retro PC. This is how it started for me, my very first own computer. And in this video the goal is to share my knowledge, my tips that I've accumulated over the years with you, including some resources to set up DOS for example, to get into playing some old DOS games. Now, the 386 is a little bit more complex compared to like a Pentium 2. So if you're in the market, maybe you're looking at buying a complete system ready to go. Maybe you already have one and you want to restore it, give it some TLC, or maybe you're looking at buying individual parts from eBay. There's a lot to talk about, so let's start this video. Let's start with the motherboard first and I'll give you some purchasing tips. So 386 machines, they are quite old and when you're shopping online, for example, I would first identify, is this an experienced seller or is this someone who is parting out a machine from their collection or is it someone that has no idea about computers that just found an old computer maybe in the shed and want to sell them. If it's a professional seller and they're selling all sorts of computer gear and the auction says untested, not sure if it's working, uh, no guarantee, that's a huge red flag. Of course they've tested it because they know if a 386 machine works then they can demand a huge premium. If it's a collector then I would be most interested. They're usually in, on the lookout for the machine to go to a good home. They've looked after it. It was probably in the corner in the retro lab and uh, very well looked after. That's the sort of machine I would go for. And the last one, a person selling a computer that doesn't really sell computers, that just found something in the shed. Well, the price has to be right because it's a bit of a lottery. If the battery, for example, leaked, it could be a total disaster. Maybe some of the other cards have also been removed. They gutted the, the hard drive, the RAM, the processor, it's all missing. You just don't know with such auctions. So here, maybe if you can inspect the machine, that's something I would recommend. I build a lot of computer projects on this channel, usually a, a new system every week. So I stopped using cases. I just don't have the space and I don't really enjoy working with cases too much if you have to put something together every week. But for you guys, it's part of the feeling having a nice 80 case, uh, vintage 386 with the turbo button and the megahertz display. For me, I just use a test bench. Here we have the system assembled. So yeah, for that authentic retro feel, it has to be a nice AT desktop case. Ideally, that's what I had back in the day, but we already had some mini tower cases as well. Regardless, if you're buying a complete desktop or you're looking for a main board, you really need to check and inspect this particular area here where the battery is located. Batteries are known to leak and then uh, corrode and destroy the traces on the motherboard. Sometimes it can be repaired, but if the damage is too great, it's almost impossible to get them back to life. And I have removed the battery and there's some headers here for an external battery pack that you can connect so that the CMOS settings are saved. For the memory, you need 30 pin SIM memory. And again, ideally it's included in the machine or the main board that you're purchasing. In terms of capacity, four megabytes is plenty. Most games will run with just one megabyte of RAM in the machine, but four megabyte is a good number. Documentation can be an issue with 386 main boards. There are some online databases where you can filter certain criteria to identify your main board and hopefully there's some information. I will put links down below in the video description and Googling your mainboard number, looking for images and trying to see what the jumpers are set at is also a good strategy. Most 386 machines have cache memory on the mainboard, usually a capacity of 64 kilobytes or 128 kilobytes. That will boost the performance. So if the cache chips are missing, your 386 will be quite a bit slower. So pay attention when you're shopping around, the cache chips should be included. Sometimes the sellers, they remove them and sell the chips individually to make more money. This chip here is the oscillator chip. It can be removed and swapped out for a different frequency. It's usually half the clock speed. So this is a 80 megahertz chip. 
which gives us half the clock speed for the 386 running at 40 megahertz. If you want the machine to run at 33 megahertz, you need a 66.7 megahertz oscillator. If you want the processor to run at 25 megahertz, you need an oscillator chip running at 50 megahertz. You will need an adapter for the keyboard. This one plugs into the AT keyboard port and converts into a more modern PS2. You will need a mouse. These are serial. They connect into the COM port on the I.O. controller. And unfortunately, they're not optical like modern mice. They use a mechanical little ball. Another adapter we need is for the power supply. We have the AT power connector here and this adapter converts into ATX. So you can use a modern power supply with your 386. The monitor is a very important choice you need to make. Ideally, you grab a CRT monitor. The image that you're gonna get from a CRT is just very unique and DOS games, they run at different resolutions and different refresh rates. Most games run at 320 by 270 Hertz and the CRT image, it's got a double scanned look, very thin detailed scan lines and it's just a very unique look, very hard to replicate. Now, in the past, I was happy using a VGA uh, LCD monitor with the VGA cable. It works, but the image you're gonna get, the pixels, it just doesn't look right. And in recent video projects, I've been playing around with DOSBox staging and the CRT shader. And then I grabbed my CRT monitor and now I really can't unsee it. So ideally have a CRT monitor uh, for the best picture. If you don't have one and you need to use a LCD VGA monitor, double check that it supports aspect ratio controls. Maybe there's a button at the front or in the menu where you can force the image to four by three aspect ratio with some bars on the sides. And also make sure it has a button, a convenient button at the front to auto adjust the image so it's nicely centered and calibrated. You will definitely need a graphics card. VGA is the way to go with a 386. Here we have a model with the chip from Tang, the ET4000. These are very highly sought after, excellent performance, excellent compatibility with games. Other chipsets I can highly recommend are Western Digital and Cirrus Logic. The next tier would be something like a Trident. They are middle of the pack and cards to avoid if you see something with the chipset from Oak, they, yeah, they can really slow down your machine in games. The topic of sound cards is way beyond what I want to cover in this video. I just wanna make a point that this is a plug and play sound card and it will work in a 386. You do not need a modern machine with a plug and play BIOS. With the creative cards, there is a creative plug and play manager that will initialize the resources and you're good to go. So don't be afraid of using a plug and play sound card in a 386. Benchmarking computer is always fun. Now the 386, you will not break any speed records. It's a little bit on the slow side, but that's a good thing. Slow is good. There are many speed sensitive games that run perfectly fine on a 386. To help people out with Benchmarks, the idea really is to test the machine and see that everything checks out, that you're not losing any performance. It can happen that the machine is set in the uh, low turbo mode, so the turbo button is not uh, active. And by using the uh, DOS benchmark pack, which you can download from my website, it has a bunch of benchmarks uh, ready to go. The one I recommend for a 386 is option number one, which is the 3D Bench version 1.0 and on a fast 386 with 40 megahertz you should get a score of around 15 or 16 and then you can compare it with other people. Now if you, if you have a 386 DX and you're getting a score of 10 or lower there's something not quite right there. So that was the purpose of putting together such a pack, make it really easy for you to test the machine and compare how it performs. Configuring MS-DOS, especially all the memory options can be quite confusing. Your machine might have four megabytes of RAM. You try to run a game and it says, well, you don't have enough conventional memory. What the heck is that? So to make it easy, I put together a MS-DOS starter pack. You just run and install 
batch file, it installs all the files. And then you get a boot menu where you can choose what memory type do you want. Do you want a mouse? Do you want a CD-ROM driver and so on. So yeah, I like doing that because the hobby of retro PC gaming can be quite complicated and I want to share the love, get more people interested, excited in this awesome hobby. Storage is a really interesting topic. To put things into perspective, my 386 back in the day had 80 megabytes of hard drive capacity. So we definitely need an IO controller. This one has the Gold Star Prime 2 chip. I had very good experiences with this one. We've got the ID port here, floppy. It has a serial port header over there, another COM port on the back. This is the printer port and there's another port here for a joystick. Now there are some jumpers here and they enable and disable certain components, certain resources as well as changing the base address. If it doesn't come with documentation you can search for images online and look for uh, default jumper positioning. A few tips when connecting the wires. There's a little marking here that indicates pin number one and that should line up with the wire that is indicated with a different color. You can see it here. That way you're plugging in the cable the right way. If you're using a modern 80 pin wire, you will need to pierce a little hole right into this pin. You definitely want a floppy drive. You can of course have a proper three and a half inch floppy drive. I like to use a modern replacement. This is the GoTech USB floppy emulator. It has worked very well for me. With the hard drive, there are many options. You can use a authentic mechanical hard drive. I don't have one that's suitable for 386 and I prefer using modern flash storage solutions. Now, this solution I use in many of my projects. It's the StarTech ID to SATA adapter. This adapter does not work on a 386 machine. I'm not sure why, but none of the SATA to ID adapters that I've purchased in the past have ever worked on a 386. So a much better alternative are these two options. We've got compact flash and SD card. They're very similar. The adapters for the SD cards are a little bit more expensive, but the cards are much cheaper now and readily available. It's the opposite here. The adapters are cheap, but getting a CF card now is yeah demanding a little bit of a premium. There is one benefit of this one. We have a jumper for master and slave. This comes in handy when you using a single ID ribbon cable to also plug in an optical drive. With the SD card adapters, there is no jumper for master slave. You can try to configure your optical drive to cable select and in some situations this will work. But if your storage controller only has a single ID channel and you want to use storage as well as an optical drive, then you can use a sound card. Here we've got an ESS audio drive and that has a dedicated ID interface here where you can plug in the CD-ROM. In terms of the hard drive, this BIOS is quite modern. It can auto detect the hard drive, but if it doesn't have that, don't be scared. You can manually configure the cylinders, the heads and the sectors. If you go with 1024 for the cylinders, 16 heads and 63 sectors, you will get 504 megabytes and that should work on most 386 machines. That's enough capacity for a lot of retro games, so a nice failsafe. Beyond that, if you want to unlock higher capacities, you might want to use software. Dynamic disk overlay is the keyword. I have some software for you to download from the Phil's Computer Lab website if that is something you want to try out for yourself. There are I.O. controllers that have a primary and a secondary ID connector, but I think they are a little bit harder to find. That's why I recommend you can connect the optical drive to the sound card. Now, speaking of the optical drive, I would make sure it's got a headphone port at the front with the volume dial uh, because I like to use an external audio mixer and that makes it really easy to get the signal and route it into your external mixer. At the back we have the ID 
interface here and here you can select uh, master slave or cable select and this is where the uh, four pin wire goes if you want to route the CD audio music into this sound card. You might also need various adapters to go from the Molex connector to the smaller Berg uh, plug that you will find on floppy drives for example. So guys there was a lot to talk about the 386. Now big picture conclusion the 386 is a very narrow retro PC um, in terms of speed. It's compatible with games from the late 80s mostly and some of the games for, from the very early 90s but you will quickly find it will run out of speed once you play games from the early to mid 1990s. For example games like Doom, Ultima Underworld, Strike Commander, they will struggle on this machine. But older games, there are so many fantastic games. The 386 with VGA and a Sound Blaster, it was from the era where the PC gaming became yeah, superior to, for example, home computers like the Amiga. Whereas before that, if you had a 286 with EGA graphics and PC speaker, then most of the releases on the Amiga were actually superior. To me, the 386 is very special. I had this golden year of playing awesome games on my 386. Games like Wing Commander 2, Monkey Island 2, the uh, Fate of Atlantis, The Heart of China and many other fantastic games. I later upgraded to a CD-ROM drive, the first one from Mitsumi, a single speed drive and yeah, then the performance and the features just exploded. Uh, every few years you doubled or tripled the performance, it was absolutely fantastic, totally different to what we have these days. I did my best to cover everything I know but of course sometimes I forget things if you have something to share that you yeah maybe you were sitting there screaming at the TV oh you forgot to mention this leave it down below in the comments that's where we can interact with each other and share our knowledge our experience and yeah now I want to hear from you let me know what is your experience with the 386 did you have one um, because we all at different ages Retro PC gaming has a different meaning to each uh, one of us. For me, it started with the 386. That's why I really love this machine. Um, but as I said, it's a very narrow focus with just a few years where you get optimal performance. We still have the turbo button so we can slow down the machine, enabling uh, speed sensitive games to run on this computer. So that is the beauty. And yeah, there's a lot to this platform. Just pay attention when you shop online. Uh, I gave you some tips in the, in the beginning, what to look out for and what to avoid. And yeah, that's it. If you found the video interesting, please make sure to subscribe to the channel. We always have some, something fun uh, in the works. And that's it. Thank you for watching and I shall see you soon with another one.